All right, we're live. Welcome everyone to the uh, third, or actually third and a half, uh, <laughs> Max Love Project nutritional coaching session or online nutritional coaching session. Uh, joining us today again is Blakely Page, a registered dietitian who works with children with special needs and comes from a whole foods, real foods um, uh, philosophy slash background. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Blakely. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. All right. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. We have a bunch of stuff to cover today, and uh, we, we only have a, a very short hour in which to do it. Um, so we're, uh, we're going to cover some really broad topics today, uh, talking about recipes and um, general approaches to different sorts of meals. Um, and then we're also going to get pretty specific, talk, talking about some specific nutritional needs. So I think there's going to be something for everybody here. Um, so let's, let's start with a question from one mom who uh, asks if, Blakely, if you have any suggestions for meals that would appease a variety of eaters. So uh, we try to avoid high fructose high fructose corn syrup, dyes, sugar, etc. With the holidays, we'll be seeing lots of my siblings and their kids eat the standard American diet of chicken nuggets, Kraft mac and cheese, and so on. Meal time is always a bit of a struggle, and I usually just bring something different for my kids to eat. But is there something that we could make for everybody? Um, or, or I guess maybe just to slightly change the question, what sorts of things should, should parents uh, be thinking about that could appeal to a wide range of eaters and still be really healthy for their kids in treatment or post-treatment? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. And family holidays can be really tricky um, because you can often put, you know, three, four, five different food philosophies and paradigms in the same room and everybody needs to figure out what works for them. Um, a few ideas that came to mind are really keeping the fruit available mm. where the sweets and the treats are um, kind of counterbalanced with fresh fruit that's available because um, a lot of times when you've got kids with food sensitivities or kids that are on more restrictive diets, um, the fruit can kind of be a bridge between you know, the hardcore Christmas candies and hardcore Christmas treats and the total no sugar world. So. Um, you know, unless unless that's going to interfere majorly with, with someone's ketogenic diet, which I know a lot of our families are pursuing, you know, the fresh fruit can be a good bridge because a lot of kids, even if they're eating mac and cheese, they're still willing to eat fruit um, as a side. Um, another thing to consider are some of your traditional recipes that you modify just using better ingredients. So something like a broccoli cheese um, chicken casserole. Mm. Um, where, you know, maybe you use the rice, maybe you don't, depending on what, you know, type of diet. But that could be an easy gluten-free recipe. You can also really get the fat content high um, in that sauce, and then you've got your veggies in there. And, you know, some sort of modified recipe like that where you use your traditional creamy casserole type thing that a lot of kids are used to or would enjoy. You just use real food. So you use you know, fresh or frozen broccoli, you use a high quality cheese, um, and don't add your cream, you know, your canned cream mushroom soups, cream chicken soups, and, you know, your breadcrumbs and all that stuff to the top. So modifying some of your traditional recipes just to use better ingredients um, can be helpful. And um, even hey, just Blakely, basically, Yeah. Um, speaking of cheese, so for quite a while we've uh, been on... Or we we've, we've been really focusing on grass-fed cheeses. Do you, um, how important is it for parents? I mean, is cheese one one place where parents can uh, fudge a little bit and not worry as much about the grass-fed part? I think um, specifically when you're in scenarios where you've got to include a lot of people and you've got to do larger meals, that sometimes it would be a place to fudge a little bit if the tolerance is okay. Um, you know, if you've got a kid who really doesn't tolerate a lot of cheese, and obviously you're going to modify that in the recipe, and you might use very little, or you might do, you know, two different casseroles where the kids are still eating mostly the same thing, but you've got a dairy-free one, etc. Um, but the grass-fed cheese is always going to be your 
premier option and it's really going to give you the good benefits of that fat in um, those grass-fed components but you know for holidays or for large groups that's kind of where I tend to modify a little bit just because not everybody I mean the reality is not everybody cares and yeah. I could spend ten dollars on my cheese and nobody <laughs> care and nobody eat it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for one yeah. meal yeah. or I could save that cheese for putting on you know she could save that cheese to put on her kids plate during a snack when the other kids have the cheese that they normally eat you know with cheese and fruit or something like that so it's kind of, one of those things that for a large holiday meal I probably would go a step down um, if people aren't going to appreciate it. That might sound really funny. Um, it may not be the right philosophy um, as far as you know encouraging healthy eating, but when people don't understand or care, then I'm probably not going to you know spend twenty dollars on cheese for a casserole. Right. Um, for one meal. Um, another question that I uh, had that piggybacked on on this uh, something that we do that. Uh, everybody loves is um, Lily's sugar-free chocolate. Have you tried it yet? I actually have not. I keep meaning to grab some because I hear such great things about it, and I haven't gotten my hands on it yet. Yeah. So for Christmas, uh, what what we've been doing is we've been getting um, uh, these xylitol candy cane lollipops, and then grounding them up so the chunks are just big enough for them to see, but not not that big, melting the chocolate with coconut oil, and then putting them into molds with the candy cane chips, and uh, the kids are crazy about them, but their friends are as well, and so it's right. one thing that, like, everybody can, you know, freak out about, and there's so much candy going around right now that this yeah. is just a fantastic way to just appease everybody and say, okay, you can have your holiday sweets right. without the sugar, so. Exactly. Uh, that's a great that's a great idea and that's a great you know one of those things that you can do ahead of time and just take you w with you to the family event so it's not that you're carting in so much of your own stuff and this is you know and making everything so different um, a couple other ideas on that one are um, another again modifying some of the standard American diet foods that are gonna keep the nieces and nephews and aunts and uncles eating but with your quality of ingredients, so like a homemade mac and cheese, um, may, even if you do use a rice pasta or whatever, um, most people, I mean, the gluten-free rice pastas are um, so good that no, they're not going to know the difference. Um, and you can also use a lot less pasta than the recipe calls for and up the veggies and that type of thing um, so that it's not just a full-on carb load. Um, also chopping up deli meat or... Um, adding chicken, you know, adding your protein to that, almost kind of making it as a casserole. Um, meat roll-ups are another great thing that um, even a lot of kids who normally are used to mac and cheese and chicken nuggets, a lot of times I've seen them do just great with little meat roll-ups, you know, with some a pepper in the middle or even just meat and cheese for the hardcore standard American kids. Yeah. Um, you know, put a tomato or some peppers inside, you know, have options where the kids kind of make their own roll-up. And if the nieces and nephews choose meat and cheese, great, that's up to them. If, when your kids are, you know, eating lots of different veggies and they get the option to put those in there. Um, and the final idea on that is soups and stews. So, um, you know, it's, it's Christmas, it's winter, um, or at least it's, you know, even if it's not cold outside for you, it's stew and soup season. So doing, um, you know, some beef stews or some chicken soup, um, you know, a great chicken vegetable soup, just leave the noodles out and you get all your veggies, you get your homemade bone broth, you get that great chicken, you know, that's something you can take the, you can make your homemade stock, take your stock to the family meal, you know, um, and throw the soup together when you get there um, so that you can, that. you know, yeah. if people are sharing stuff so you can actually get that really good quality stock in there. So those were just some of the ideas. Um, and, you know, trying as much as possible to um, just balance the quality of food your kids have available, um, but also not going so overboard that your kids are out of place with cousins and things like that. So just adding things to those really, you know, standard, the, the really bleak and <laughs> bland uh, mac and cheese, chicken nugget type meals, just add to them the good stuff. 
um, and just add more options versus this is what my kids eat and this is what your kids eat. Because your kids will be used to eating the stuff they're used to eating, and that's probably the stuff that they're going to choose. And so, you know, adding more options versus separating out um, whose is whose can kind of help maintain the atmosphere a little bit better. Cool. Cool, great. All right, so let's move on to our second question here. Um, all right, so this mom wants help um, to see if you can recommend or if you have any recommendations uh, for a high um, anti-nuclear antibodies number. So the, her child has a high ANA number, anti-nuclear antibodies number number um, in a nine-year-old. We are addressing her food allergies, removed grains for the most part, and her eczema and asthma are so much better, but her ANA and eosinophils uh, remain high still. Brought her to a rheumatologist in Boston at Boston Children's and she physically checks out fine, which is great, but no one knows why her ANA is so high. We are watching and waiting basically and are concerned that it can turn into lupus or leukemia. Her sibling passed away from AML in October 2012. Um, so anything uh, uh, nutritionally that can be done about high, a high ANA number. Right. So I'll first of all say that I am not an expert in the area in this area, you know, by any means. But what I do know about ANA numbers is that it is they are antibody numbers showing us there's inflammation somewhere, um, and they can be hard to nail down. Um, I've seen a couple cases where you know the gut's healed, the body's clean, you know, everything's in place, which it looks like you guys are kind of on that path, um, but that ANA number's still high and then down the road something does show up. So, you know, as far as your train of thought of knowing that that ANA number is still being high is problematic, I think you're on the right track. Um, but I, unfortunately, sometimes I think it's really hard to pin down where that is coming from, and that sounds like the stage that you're in. Um, my suggestion for food is to really keep digging into those food sensitivities. So, you know, not just the allergies. So, you know, your, your rheumatologist and everybody are going to do all your allergy testing. So, obviously, pay attention to your hardcore allergies. But I would also, you know, get with a holistic MD or a naturopath or a chiropractor and do actual food sensitivity testing um, so that you can really find out what food she's reacting to right now. Um, that list could be really long if there's a lot of inflammation still happening. And, that, and in that case, you might end up doing a rotation diet where you take, you know, say if your test gives you red, red category, yellow category, green category, red being the highest reaction, and there's 30 foods on that red category, you might end up doing a three- or four-day rotation diet where she just doesn't eat those, you know, those red foods get rotated day in and day out so she's not having five red foods in a day type thing. And there's ways to do, that's essentially what you end up having to do when you have a whole lot of foods that you're reacting to. You can't take everything out and still be nourished and be functional, and so you rotate them so that the body gets a break from them every four days. Um, but really honing in on those food sensitivities, um, if you're really serious about it and really want to figure out what she's reacting to, those tests can be done as often as needed because those sensitivities change as our body changes. So most people would recheck... Um, you know, a lot of people might recheck every six months. Um, depending on financially what's possible, you could even be rechecking every three months and see how that list is changing. Um, and you know, there's, there's controversy on the, the um, validity of the food sensitivity testing, um, and for good reason, because the, the technology just isn't there to uh, really know what our body is doing. are you still there? Yep, I'm still here. Looks like you're frozen, though. Oh, there we go. Um, we just we just paused. Okay. Can can you see me now? Yep, I can see you. All right. Okay. 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 So, so um, I'm not sure if that will come through in the video. Right. So can you uh start again where you said um there's controversy about the these uh, sensitivity tests. Right. So there's you know, five or six companies that do the testing, and everybody has different opinions about who's best. Um, but really, when you get to your um, main companies, you know, I just think that you have to go with 
um, a practitioner that you trust and trust that they've done their research and that they're actually using that test enough to know um, where its pitfalls are. Um, what uh, what sorts of things should a parent look for? Let's say a parent, you know, they have just they have their regular doctor who has no interest in this, and you know their oncologist and you know whoever else, and they are trying to find a doctor who will support this and are interested. What should parents be looking for? Yeah, um, you're looking for some of the you're looking for the companies that do the test, um, and then the practitioner that uses those companies. And so um, there's one company called Alcat A L C A T. And that's one of the more trusted um, companies out there. When mm -hmm. you start reading about Alcat, then you start to hear the names of some of the other companies. And so then you can kind of look into them. And every single one of those websites for those companies will have find a practitioner. And oh, so you okay. Can find that's a practitioner okay. that uses that test. And, and then that practitioner is going to be familiar with it. They're going to have their reps and everybody who's, you know, educating them and, and they're just using it day in and day out, and so they have a good feel for it. I tend to lean more towards AllCat, um, only because the practitioner that I trust um, uses that one. Um, I'm kind of blanking on some of the other names, but there's um, Cyrex Labs, and that's C-Y-R-E-X, um, is the premier for gluten sensitivity testing, and they do all kinds of other testing as well. Um, and then Metametrics is another great company um, I think this is still doing some food sensitivity testing. Um, so, you know, really honing in on, on, and she may mean food sensitivities when she says allergies in this question, I don't know, but really honing in on what's your body react, reacting to food-wise and how can we get that um, down and watch those ANA numbers and then just overall anti-inflammatory protocol um, of low sugar, good quality fats, good quality meats, that whole deal is where I'd go nutritionally for that. Cool. Perfect. All right. Uh, question number three here. Um, so this mom writes, my son loves yogurt, just plain vanilla though. Is this a healthy snack? And if so, which brand is the best to buy? He also loves to drink kefir. Is this a good product for him as well? He is getting the probiotics he needs to try and keep him regular since his diagnosis. That has been a major issue for us, uh, being regular. Um, and uh, right, so so I'll, I'll just cut off the question there, um, and then uh, if you could speak more generally about um, the issues of getting probiotics and prebiotics from from food. In, uh, in addition or perhaps um, uh, instead of getting them from, a, from, from pills? Exactly. Um, it's a great question about the yogurt. Um, the first thing that I would say about the vanilla yogurt is that, um, you know, I think store-bought plain vanilla yogurt is an okay snack. There's lots of, there's lots of worse snacks out there, <laughs> no. um, but it wouldn't be in my top ten. Um, as far as store-bought vanilla. The reason is the store-bought um, yogurt typically doesn't have a really powerful high amount of probiotic. You know, it might be fermented six or eight hours versus a homemade yogurt, which could be fermented up to 24 hours and get a really strong probiotic in there. Additionally, your vanilla, even though it's plain vanilla, your vanilla is still going to be loaded with sugar. And so, you know, if you were doing a store-bought plain yogurt that had no vanilla and you were flavoring it yourself, then you would have control over the sugar content of that yogurt. So that's where some modifications to the yogurt can still allow him to have the snack that he loves, um, but without, with, with some better properties. So, for example, um, making, well, as far as store-bought, um, brands that I recommend, the only brand of store-bought that I really would spend money on at this point is called Nancy's. Um, it's an organic yogurt and the reason I like it so much is because um, it has multiple strains of probiotic and so you get a little bit higher boost of your actual um, bacteria activity in that yogurt. Um, and, and one other pitfall that I just thought of of the plain yogurt, of the plain vanilla, is it's often hard to get that in full fat. Oftentimes that's a low fat yogurt. 
and anytime we're eating dairy, we want the full fat. We need the full fat um, to get some good properties there. So low fat, store bought, pre sugared yogurt is really going to be comparable sugar wise to possibly even some candies or some processed foods. It's just there's yeah. not a you lot know, of power happening there. Yeah, our uh, we were at. Um, a, a very well-known health food grocery store the other day um, with a huge aisle of yogurts. I mean, all different brands and kinds. Yeah. And we go by, and we never buy yogurt um, because of the sugar stuff, but uh, we had our three-year-old daughter with us, and she looked at it, and she said, oh, I want yogurt. And, and <laughs> so like, okay, let's start to look at all the packages. And we looked at every single one, and, you know, Every single one that was not just plain, with nef just just absolutely plain. Every single one that was flavored in any sort of way had a ungodly amount of sugar in it. I mean, ridiculous. Right. And when you say that it's comparable to candy, that's absolutely right. I mean, comparable to a soda, you know, like. Right. Um, so uh, it, it it was we. You know, it's been so long since we actually looked at at, at this, and now that we have more of a of of a you know way to compare these sugar numbers, we were just astounded. Like, wow, exactly. this is considered to be a healthy snack for for kids, right? I mean, you you give your kids right. you know healthy yogurt, and then you look on the back, and there's you know thirty five grams, grams of sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is that when you're trying to get your full fat yogurt, um, oftentimes they're not in those small individual servings, which are too big mm -hmm. anyway. They're in your, you know, pint size or your quart size um, containers, and so you end up buying a really large container of your full fat yogurt. Which, if um, you know, if that's what you're, if again going for, if you're gonna buy a store bought, I would try to get the highest quality as possible get full fat, and then flavor it and sweeten it yourself with honey or fresh fruit and things like that. Um, even weaning your son off of the amount of sugar that he needs in his yogurt. I mean, I know plenty of kids who eat plain yogurt um, that's sour, and they love it. Um, and so you can slowly start to wean down his, to his tolerance of switching from the sugar to the sour. Um, ideally, your best solution is going to be to make your own yogurt. And you can do that from your own raw milk. Um, if you are, you know, comfortable and find your source of raw milk, you can do that with a with a whole pasteurized milk. And you can even use um, something like your Nancy's yogurt as your starter. Um, and then you can ferment that yogurt for a full 24 hours, where you actually get a full fat, powerful probiotic that's going to be easy to digest, um, low in sugar, and then you flavor. Um, and sweeten yourself. So that's um, that would be the ideal thing for the yogurt. Um, but if if that's not going to be you know feasible for you and your lifestyle, then I would say decrease the frequency, um, get the fat content of it up, and buy the plain and add the vanilla flavor um, and the sweetness yourself. Well, I love that idea of making uh, your own yogurt. Um, that that might be something we're going to have to try in the future. Um, it's a lot easier than people think. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I've I've been reading a lot about uh, fermenting food and, and you know the its uh, importance as a probiotic and a prebiotic, um, and, you know, for gut health. And so so uh, we're we're gonna try to make our own sauerkraut because it, mm -hmm. I. I uh, from what I've heard, it's it's a very easy thing to do as well, um, but it's probably a lot harder to get kids to eat sauerkraut than it is to get them to eat yogurt. True. You'd be surprised, though. There's a lot of kids who actually, once they start eating it, they crave it. I talked to um, a client yesterday who's 19-year-old son who um, has autism will just, he'll eat a whole cup of fermented vegetables. Wow. I know kids who, who beg for them. You know, mom or friend has come up with a good recipe, and the kids will ask for them at dinner, and it's just something that they have every night with dinner is fermented veggies. And it's one of those things that you develop a palate for. I'm we're still working on my sauerkraut, you know, <laughs> not there yet. Yeah. Um, but cultured carrots, um, you know, well, all the those things. Thing oh, yeah, so I, the other thing about sauerkraut, because I just in the past couple weeks have been – 
really getting into it and just buying stuff from the store because I'm not confident en enough yet, you know, uh, yeah. to try our own and just a wide variation. And then to understand that that most store-bought sauerkraut has been pasteurized, so you have to look for the raw sauerkraut. And right. then even amongst the few brands that do raw, uh, like Bubby's is a, uh, is a well-known one, just trying all the different brands that do raw sauerkraut and the and the really wide variety of taste between them. And so there's right. a real, there's a skill to it, and, and there's a wide variation. Right, them. and even when you make it yourself, you're going to make one batch, and it's going to taste different than the next because mm -hmm. the bacteria that's in your home and the bacteria that you're cultivating at that time is what where those flavors come from. Yeah. And so, you know, you'll kind of come up with, you'll play around with your own recipes, and you'll get one that, you kind of land on probably, but it'll taste different every time. And then how long you let it ferment will change the flavor as well. Um, yep. But don't be scared of it. It's much easier than you think. Um, <laughs> cool. And, you, can, you know, a lot of times if you start with carrots or cucumbers and do pickles or carrots first, it's, you know, a little bit more palatable for kids than the full-on sauerkraut. Um, even to just get start getting the flavors of the fermentation, the Bubby's brand is a great way to go. Um, even the pickles are a good start. And don't ever throw away that juice. You can just, you know, take a swig of that juice and um, once the pickles are gone or oh, the sauerkraut's gone. I didn't know that. The probiotics are in that juice. And oh. so, you know, just even if the vegetables are gone, then everybody could just get a, you know, a teaspoon of the the juice left over and still get some of those those fresh fermented probiotics. That's cool. One uh, one thing about the bubbies, too, because uh, I was at the store earlier today um, and uh, – they had pickles and sauerkraut and stuff. So I was, uh, I wanted pickles, and I was looking through the various pickles, and one of the kinds they had was a bread and butter chips thing. And I looked on the back because now I read every label of every product. It doesn't matter what I buy. And there was five grams of sugar per serving in that one. Right. Um, but they don't add sugar to any of the other ones. So so um, that's just something for parents to keep in mind. Even with a reputable brand and a product that is probably otherwise really good, you still have to check. And sure enough, there you know there was some stuff in there. And and so yeah. right next to that kind was a whole pickle that had no sugar in, in it. Um, and so uh, I right. ended up getting that one in, and I'm sure it's going to be just as good so. yeah the that the bubby's dill pickles are actually what I do most of the time um, rather than making my own not that I'm opposed to it I like the ones that I make I just don't do it as often as I had hoped to um, mm -hmm. the other thing on the fresh ferments um, on the cultured veggies it's a fabulous way to get your probiotics in in addition to or instead of your probiotic pills um, so again for this this question that we originally started with you know they're really needing probiotics to keep that kiddo regular and the fermented foods can do um, a lot of that and at a fraction of the cost. This stuff is so cheap to make, it's unbelievable. I mean, there's nothing cheaper than a head of cabbage and some salt, yeah. you know, to be getting this fresh ferment. And um, so it's, you know, it's a really powerful food. The other thing about the fresh ferments is they tend to actually take root and make their home in our gut, the, the probiotics from foods versus the probiotics from pills are transient. So... Um, you know, when you take them, they do their job, but you have to keep taking them for them to keep doing their job. Mm. There's research that shows that the fresh ferments actually embed in our gut for longer periods of time, and they make that kind of their home um, more effectively than the bacteria we get from our pills. So unless you have a major episode of vomiting or diarrhea or take an antibiotic for a long period of time where you totally wipe out your gut bacteria, you're going to your body is going to actually cultivate that good bacteria from your cultured veggies um, and your homemade fermented foods um, much better than your probiotic pills. Um, well, it's just a matter of getting them in us and getting it, you know, consistently happening. Um, the additional thing, um, a couple resources for your fermented foods. Some people um, like to start with a, cul a culture starter. So they like to be able to just, you know, pour in a powder and with their veggies and water and know that they've got good bacteria that's happening. Um, wise Choice Markets 
and Cultures for Health are two companies that you can buy your different starters, and especially with the vegetables, you get some of your flavoring components as well, your seasoning mixes and that sort of thing. That takes a little bit of the guesswork out, um, and the other people just like to play around with it um, and see what they get. Um, so yeah, those are some resources. I was going to ask about that because I know one of the recommendations regarding choosing a probiotic pill um, is to get one with a wide uh, a wide variety of strains, so like a bunch of different strains in there. So my question was, with these fermented veggies, um, are you know are are we getting a wide variety of strain, or is it is there just one or two? In there? You're getting a very wide variety, and you don't actually know what you're getting, and so your body actually benefits from those changes because mm. um, you're getting whatever bacteria the atmosphere finds, and that vegetable can produce. And there's not a clear-cut chart of if you ferment carrots, this is the bacteria you get. Um, most, I think, you know, there's, there actually probably is more information about that than I know. I haven't looked into it in depth. But, um, you know, you would get it. You get some of your bifidobacteria and lactobacillus bacteria if you were doing a lacto-fermentation, so doing a dairy ferment. Obviously, you're going to get more of the bifidus and more of the lactobacillus. Um, but that's, again, another huge plug for your fresh ferments is that you get a wide variety of bacteria that's different every time you make it. The bacteria you get when you make culture veggies in your home is going to be different than the bacteria um, someone else gets when they make culture veggies in their home because you started with your host environment and a lot of people end up um, preferring the taste of the ones that they make at home because it's actually kind of local to their environment. Yeah, yeah. So, I love that idea. Yeah. Very cool. Very so cool. don't don't be afraid of it. It's you know it's it's one of those things that you just got to start and practice and play around with and you know mess it up and get something too sour or nobody likes it and you try again or you know it's it's definitely something you got to develop a palate for for most people. But I'm I honestly amazed at how some kids their bodies will start to crave them and they love them. That's so cool. So um so could you. Tell us a little bit about prebiotics. Um, so I understand prebiotics is basically being the food for these good bugs in our in our guts. So how should we eat, or what should we do to make sure that the that the bugs in our guts have have the right kind of food? Right. So your prebiotics essentially are the food that, like you just said, the food that the good bacteria eat. So our probiotics are the ones that give us the good bacteria. Our prebiotics are the ones that help um, cultivate and eat and produce more of that good bacteria. So they're, those two have a symbiotic relationship. So they work together um, to really cultivate a good, a good host in, that, in your gut. Um, the prebiotics um, really in foods end up being soluble fiber. So your, your fruits and veggies um, are, some of the, are your best sources of your prebiotics. There's plenty of pills um, that are combining prebiotics and probiotics now. So you'll find probiotic brands and um, and pills that have the prebiotics added to them. That's usually in the form of what's called FOS, fructo oligosaccharides, yeah. um, or yeah. inulin is another one that's often added to products as a prebiotic. Um, but you're going to get those in foods like yogurt, leeks, onions, artichokes, um, you know, there's plenty of lists of foods out there where you get your prebiotics. And they're a great thing to have on board because it, again, just revs up that digestive system where the good bacteria then has something to eat which fuels them and reproduces them more rapidly. With something like, uh, well, just veggies in general, um, do we lose any prebiotic function with cooking? Um, you do, honestly, I can't recall exactly. My, I'm pretty sure that the, you get some when they've been cooked, um, but your raw veggies are going to give you your best source. Yeah. The catch with raw veggies is to make sure you're chewing them really well so that you're not impending digestion if you're working on any gut healing. Right. And then this is a random question, but two things that we uh, have done for Max for a long time, and I'm just wondering if, if this is helping at all, 
is uh, he does the sugar-free coconut milk ice cream, and that has a, a pretty high level of fiber, at least the, that's what the nutrition fact says. I don't know what kind of fiber it, 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 it is, but it has a high level. And then we also do a lot of the Lily's chocolate, which also has a lot of fiber. So between the chocolate and the coconut milk ice cream, he's getting a lot of fiber every day. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if you know, like, do 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 these act as prebiotics? Like, does all fiber, or would I need to know more about the kind of fiber? You need to know more about the kind of fiber. All fiber doesn't act as a prebiotic. It's your soluble fiber, um, which again, you can look at, you can Google those lists. You've got soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. So it's your soluble fibers that act as your prebiotics. Um, and so that's and that's what you get from your fruits and vegetables versus like your breads and grains and things like that. Those are your insoluble fibers, and so they're not necessarily needed. They're not needed for gut health or that predigestion. It's your um, inulin, chicory root, FOS, and then your fruits and vegetables that are giving you um, artichoke. You know all those things that are giving you your prebiotics. So just look and see if you can tell on the label where is that fiber coming from. If it's coconut, you know, if the source of fiber is actually coconut, then that's going to be a prebiotic. Um, and your Lily's chocolate, I don't know what it would be. It might be something like inulin or um, that type of thing. Yeah, I, well, I think it's the chocolate itself. I, I, I think yep. chocolate has, the, there's a yeah. high level of fiber in the chocolate, which, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just so in love with Lily's chocolate because sugar-free, it's got the fiber, and then, yeah. of course, there's there's a lot of data about, you know, uh, chocolate and uh, all sorts of different health the right. benefits. So if you can take the sugar out of the chocolate, then you have a lot, <laughs> you have a lot of good, good stuff in there. Exactly. Um, all, all right, so we don't have too much time, so we'll uh, move on quickly. All right, so then... Uh, um, okay, I'm going to push a couple questions down to get to um, these questions that I think would be more general. Um, okay. One mom wrote in to ask about how to deal with carb cravings. And there wasn't a lot of specificity with this question, but I can imagine there are two different issues, or maybe they're not that different, but I see them as being at least slightly different. You have carb cravings for kids, and then you have carb cravings for adults. And so... Um, you can address either or just one. Right. Well, I think they're probably pretty similar in kids and adults because carb cravings are probably going to be a blood sugar issue. Um, <clears throat> the more our blood sugar spikes up from too many carbs and drops fast, um, then the more we tend to perpetuate that craving cycle. Mm. Um, and that's going to happen in adults or children um, depending on just what your blood sugars are doing. Um, especially with children, that blood sugar re regulation can actually be, can affect them more aggressively than an adult because it affects their mood significantly. So you get a kid who gets too hungry and they get cranky and have a meltdown, well, that's a blood sugar issue. Um, you get a kid who eats, you know, doesn't eat enough protein in a meal and they crash and burn, you know, an hour or two before they may have otherwise. And so, and when we crash, when that blood sugar goes too low, too fast, and we're really at that place of like, I got to eat now, or I'm going to bite your head off, or I'm going to cry, or even for adults, um, we tend to crave carbs because our body knows that's what's going to give us um, that quick energy really fast to get our blood sugar back up and get us normalized. And so when kids or adults um, are when the blood sugar gets too low, they tend to go for the carb foods and want those foods. So typically carb cravings are a blood sugar issue. The solution is um, to actually decrease the carbs in the amount of foods that you're eating so that the body uses a different source of fuel and is no longer reliant on those big blood sugar spikes up and spikes down. Um, and you stop that cycle of kind of a recovery mode. You know, the blood sugar goes up too high, too fast. It's going to drop really fast. And then you're constantly in, the body is constantly in recovery mode. Um, you know, trying to get the blood sugar back up. And then you crave the carbs and it shoots up again. You're just doing this yo-yo all day long that really affects mood um, and the way you feel and all those things. So the solution is more meat and fat, less carbs. That's how you curb carb cravings is that you decrease the amount of carbs that you're eating and increase the amount of meat, fat, and vegetables. Um, 
even just increasing the amount of fat in yeah. a meal can really help with carb cravings because that gives the body um, a fat source of fuel, which is its actually preferred source. Um, and any time we add protein or fat, it acts as a buffer for that blood sugar rise. So the blood sugar is not going to rise as fast. And so the body, you know, it's, it's going to rise slower. And so then the body has time to produce the insulin it needs to counter-regulate the amount of carbs you are eating. And so it never ends up getting a, as fast. Um, and so then you have more of a steady blood sugar rise and you eat and your blood sugar goes up and comes down gradually like it should. Even when you're eating, you know, your primary fuel is fat, your, your body's still going to produce some um, glycogen and, or some glucose to get to, to do that normal process. But um, it just makes it a more steady curve, and so the cravings are less. When you don't have enough fat or protein in a meal, then the body's reaction is to just go up, you know, shoot that blood sugar up. The insulin doesn't really have time to get there before the blood sugar is already up, and it's too high, and then it's going to come down a lot faster because it doesn't have that fat and protein as the buffer. Mm. And so that's the long way of saying eat more fat, eat more protein. Yeah. Um, vegetables are also um, a great buffer there as well to add the volume back to your meal that you need when you've decreased the carbs. So really the issue with carb cravings is, is decrease the carbs. Yeah. I, I just uh, experientially, um, when, uh, when I decided to go on uh, the ketogenic diet with, with Max, I knew from reading around and hearing from other people that there was a period of, you know, a month or so where there's this transition and, you know, all the, you, you don't feel so great. So I knew that that was going to be a part of it. But one thing I didn't expect was the first few weeks I was just starving. And I, and, um, and I think it was, you know, kind of going off of carbs. And so I was really experiencing that. I, get, I, I didn't experience it as carb craving. I just experienced it as just general hunger. Right. But focusing on fat, just a lot of fat, um, you know, I, I think I consumed a lot of calories in those first, first few weeks, but it eventually, you know, worked itself out. And, uh, yeah, but, but just – um, eating a lot of fat was a really satisfying thing during those those weeks because the fat fills you up. I mean, it's it's a feeling of being filled that is very just. There's like a period on the end of that sentence, like you right. don't want any more food, you know. And it's very different from being full from a bunch of carbs because with exactly. a bunch of carbs, you're like, well, I could have another bite of that. Box. Right. I, 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 I could have some more, you know, but I won't. When you're full from fat, it's like, no, you're done. You know, like right. you do not want to look at food. And so uh, just experientially, I can definitely uh, vouch for, for what, uh, f for your advice on uh, curbing yeah. the carb cravings. It's, it's just add, add fat. And one of the best ways to do it um, or I'm sorry, one of the easiest ways to do it at, at first would be to do a recipe like the uh, Lily's chocolate chips with, melted with a bunch of coconut oil because um, mm -hmm. you have this really high high fat thing that, that tastes great, but you don't want that much of it because there's a lot of fat in there and it will fill yeah. you up really quickly. Um, and I think you're also probably tricked perhaps, I, I, I don't know, but... Yeah, um, another um, a great source, um, another great idea to kind of do something fun as you do start to decrease the carbs is an avocado chocolate pudding. Oh yeah. So using avocados as the base, you add your cocoa powder, cocoa powder, um, some nut butters if you want to, a little bit of um, honey or any type of sweetener, um, whatever sweetener you're using, the xylitol or um, all of those things, and so that's a really, I mean, that's a full, that's just like eating avocado oh, and yeah. um, a lot of the kiddos that I work with that has been a lifesaver for um, transitions to gluten-free casein-free for transitions for trying to gain weight for um, transitions to keto you know all of those things are you know an avocado chocolate pudding or an avocado chocolate shake um, are all things to consider to get that fat up and something that's um, that's a little bit more fun yeah. um, the other thing about the carb cravings is um, 
you know, you know, she says she's not ready to go low carb necessarily, but if we've got cravings, and that's an indication that we need to go lower. Right. Not in the full on keto world necessarily, unless it's indicated for you know medically, and they're ready to kind of start that journey. But in general, um, still getting the carbs down is going to be the only way that you get rid of those cravings. Um, and like you said, there's there's a transition period, and some kids will be, you know, their behaviors might get worse. They might be more cranky that type of thing is their body transitions from, you know, using carbs as a fuel source um, versus using fat and protein as a fuel source. Um, so just be patient with that transition if you, make a, if you make a big leap. But in general, if you cut the amount of carbs that you serve at a meal in half and you increase the amount of vegetables or meat that you um, give by half, and then you add extra fat to all those foods, then you're going to be in a much better place blood sugar-wise and metabolically than you were the day before just by cutting it in half, um, where you're not necessarily taking the foods away from the child. If, if, that's, if you're not ready to make a big transition, you're just changing the proportion of them. Awesome. Yeah. And that is a perfect segue into our uh, sixth question. Um, a mom writes in asking generally about good versus bad carbs, saying, you know, how, um, if we want to transition into a low carb diet or maybe eventually much later down the road, uh, prepare ourselves for a ketogenic diet, um, you know, what, what can we do to replace the carbs uh, or the bad carbs that we're doing with good carbs? And so, what should we be looking for in replacing bad carbs with good carbs? Yeah, it's a great question. Or maybe better carbs is. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's, you know, the, the language and the semantics can get tricky, um, especially when you're talking w with children. But um, as far as, and I'll just, you know, we'll just go with the good carb, bad carb right. deal, and we'll, you know, know that all foods have their place and there's balance and all of that. But as, you know, just to to be able to be clear and give people you know, a clear indication of what we're really talking about. I would say the carbs that you want to lean towards that would kind of be in your good carb category um, are going to be carbohydrates from your starchy tubers and your fruits. So those are, that's the best place to get your carbohydrate is um, fruits and your starchy tubers, which is going to be um, things like potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, your starchy squashes, you know, like your butternut squash and acorn squash and things like that. So your starchy tubers um, and your fruits are your best source of carbohydrate. Those are also great sources of your um, prebiotics, I believe, as well. Um, and so that's the way to go for your main carb sources. So instead of having, you know, for example, a sandwich and fruit and a vegetable for lunch, you know, maybe you just have fruit and meat roll-ups, um, and a vegetable for lunch, you know, where your carbohydrate comes from the fruit, um, and then dinner, you know, replacing your um, pastas and breads um, with your potatoes. Um, rice is kind of in between for me, um, and quinoa, both of those are gluten-free starches, um, or gluten-free grains, which I'm, you know, all about gluten-free and don't see the benefit for any of us for the gluten. Um, but those starches tend to be um, real blood sugar dysregulators. So we have to be really careful with our rice and our quinoa because they are really high in carbohydrate, and so they can really dysregulate our blood sugar easily, um, especially the quinoa. The serving size for quinoa is often much, much smaller than what people realize. And so I see people eating just big old massive bowls of quinoa. Wow. And it's like I think it might be like 30 or 45 grams of carbohydrate for like a fourth of a cup. I mean, it's just, it's a really dense carbohydrate. And I, you know, people are eating these like three cup quinoa salads and <laughs> having no clue that they're eating, you know, just just tons of carbohydrate. Um, so be careful with the quinoa. The rice um, is really, one of my favorite ways to use rice is as a carrier for bone for homemade bone broth and butter. And so rice is one of the best places to be able to really pack in grass-fed butter and homemade bone broth because it's just going to absorb it all, and yeah. it's a great carrier for those. So um, so that's, you know, another carbohydrate that has its place, um, I think, when it's used effectively. Um, do I use plain rice just as a side sometimes? Absolutely. Um, but when I have the option, I would want to cook my rice in the bone broth instead of water, 
add butter during the cooking and add butter afterward so that that fat from the butter is again buffering the carbohydrate blood sugar spike of that rice. And then, um, so that's where I would lean on my kind of good carb side. Um, and then the carbs that we're staying away from are all of our processed carbohydrates. You know, just all of the processed, all of our breads. There's really, you know, there's no bread out there. That's not true. I'm sure there's there's lots of great homemade recipes that are high in protein and all those things. But in general, um, bread is not going to be, um, even homemade breads are still going to be using our processed flours to right. make them. So you may have put all those ingredients together yourself, but you've used, you know, a rice, if you're doing gluten-free, you've used a rice flour and a sorghum flour, all of which have still been processed and are still pretty far away from their original source. So those things are really done in moderation. Um, and then, obviously, any, all of our packaged carbohydrate, all of our packaged baked goods um, are the ones that we're avoiding and having, you know, occasionally in special occasions and just less often. So when you're talking good carbs, bad carbs, um, you're leaning towards your fruit and your starchy um, vegetables as your good carb source. Corn um, is a vegetable, you know, it's a starchy vegetable, um, but it's problematic in um, a sense that a lot of people are finding are just sensitive to it and have a lot more corn allergies. Um, and then corn is our biggest producer of GMOs, you know, is our, our biggest GMO food is, you know, corn and soybeans and sugar. And so, um, you know, the corn is, is an okay carbohydrate source, but you got to make sure that you're not just pounding the body with GMO corn. So when you do use corn as a starch um, or as a side, then um, make sure it's organic or non-GMO. Um, Blakely, have you, are you familiar with the 10 to 1 rule for uh, carbs, like for every 10 gram of carbohydrates, there should be one gram of fiber. Are you familiar with that rule? Yeah, I am a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, because that's one that, that we had heard, uh, we came across maybe about a year ago, um, and it was a really fantastic, now looking back on it, it was, it, it was a really fantastic way to transition into a low carb, high fat. Mm -hmm. um, diet that that we started over the summer so we probably did about you know six to eight months using this rule so anything that we bought at the grocery store or anything you know we would just look on the back of the package and so for every 10 grams of carbohydrates there should be at least one gram of fiber um, and that uh, is because that's that's kind of the low end of the uh, ratio for a whole grain right um, and so, uh, so I just want to know what you thought of that rule. Yeah, I, th I think it's a great rule of thumb. It's a great place to start, um, you know, in that transition of having kind of some, some guide rails and some paradigm for how do we start to decrease the, the carbs. I think it depends on the person um, and the family as far as how effective it would be, whether that feels like a prison or a palace. You know, when you get into <laughs> ratios and, and the counting, you know, one person's prison yeah. is another person's palace. And so... Yeah. Um, you know, and then yeah, another, the transition, I think, can also be really helpful by increasing the protein. So kind of using the protein as that as part of that transition. As you decrease the carbs, increasing the meat products um, as you're learning how to increase the fat and make new things, you know, as far as a ketogenic transition, um, sometimes using protein as that intermediary, um, I think, can be helpful in just figuring out how to, um, form and shape and find meals that work, it can kind of get the carbs down without having to come up with something totally new all the time by just being able no. to add an extra slice of meat um, right. and decrease the carbs. Additionally, another kind of ratio um, that proves to be helpful for a lot of people, um, which I think would be helpful in the transition to keto, is a 2 to 1 carb to protein ratio. Again, this would be for your more kind of food techie side, you know, the, the mm -hmm. people who like the the technical um, counting side, it's not for everybody, um, but it would be for every 15 um, grams of, well, we'll say 30 and 15, for every 15, 30 grams of carbohydrate, you've got 15 grams of protein, so a 2 to 1 carb to protein ratio, and that's another way to keep that protein down um, and really keep that blood sugar regulated um, and just learn how to eat and find foods that are not 
so carb based or we just can so easily lose track of of the carbs when when it's not um, when we're not counting or paying attention to something. So those little rules of thumb, like the 10 to 1 or the 2 to 1, um, can be really helpful in those transition times where you really kind of hone in and, and get a little bit more technical for a few months to understand it and to change some of the, the patterns and behaviors in some of the foods you're eating. And then once you get used to it, you don't have to use, you don't have to think about it. It becomes natural. Absolutely. I Yeah, I, I, uh, what, what you just said just hits, hits home because, um, you know, for the first uh, few months on the ketogenic diet for Max, you know, everything was very tech, technical and it was actually kind of uh, worrying that, oh, you know, we're, we're focusing so much on, on this and, uh, you know, we're counting all these grams and this and that yeah. and watching every single meal and it's like, are we becoming dysfunctional? Like, is this healthy? I don't know. But then yeah. once you start to get it down, then you, you know, it, yeah, we haven't, we don't count grams of anything anymore. Like there, yeah. um, we just saw our, this is probably too much information for everybody on here, but what, maybe not. Um, we just saw our, uh, uh, the neurologist at Chalk um, a couple weeks ago, and they asked, okay, so what is the ratio you guys are using? And I was like, well, honestly, I don't know at this point because right. we start, we've, we've now found a place where we still check Max's blood glucose and ketones almost every day. So that's one thing that we do because that has really helped us, and I did want to add that on. But um, yeah. but but n now that's all that we do, and so there will be a day where it's like, oh, wow, Max's blood sugar is all the way up to like, 105, what did we eat? It's like, oh, well, we tried something new today that was like a paleo recipe that we thought would be okay, but you know what? It actually shot his blood sugar up, so we're not going to do that again. But that's but that's it. You, you know, like we don't stress out about it, you know, because we have a – we know the foods that we can eat and, and we're exactly. doing okay. Right, right. Um, but I also wanted to ask you um, – I guess this will be the last question because now we're, we're way over time and I appreciate you being so generous with your time. Um, is, you know, with these last two questions about carbs, um, you know, good, good carbs and then what to do with carb cravings, if a family is, uh, we'll say, keto curious, you know, and, and is saying, you know, maybe uh, because we have a child who, you know, uh, might still have evidence of disease, and we might have a, you know, we're no longer in treatment, but, you know, like our situation where we're not in treatment, but we do have evidence of disease, and we, we are seeing some potential progression, and so we do want to be proactive. And so for families who are thinking about going in that direction, would you suggest, and I know this might uh, not be a good idea, but would, how would you feel about a family getting a glucometer and just looking at glucose every now and then post postprandial or like after a meal just to see what the food is doing to the blood sugars because at least for us it was really eye opening that foods that we thought you know no problem were actually like really raising max blood sugar then foods that we thought might be a problem like raw carrots don't really mess up his blood sugar at all, and and so it's it, it, we found it to be really empowering to have these numbers that it's like okay, you know, whatever else we do, we can check the numbers and we know what's what's going on. Right, I think there is a place for that. I think it can be super helpful. I think so much of it is going to depend on how that kid responds to that process. So, yeah. you know, is the kid freaking out every time that you're going to prick his finger with the glucometer and you're crying and wrestling into the ground to try to get that number? Or is the oh, kid yeah. like, okay, yeah, it's, it's part of what we do, you know? And obviously I know you guys wouldn't be continuing that if Max was freaking out about it, but he's also, yeah. you know, older. Absolutely. So, well, you know, the, the thing is, I you know, maybe on the next health coaching session or, you know, one of these in the future, we can talk more about this, but, uh, you know, it, it was definitely a process to get him comfortable with it, but now yeah. he is, and now he actually requests it because he gets a little tiny sugar-free lifesaver every time he gets a pokey. Yeah. And so now he, he now he'll actually ask for it. He'll, he'll he'll say, "Can I can I get my ketones get checked?" 
<laughs> and it's like, oh, because yeah. you want the lifesaver? Yeah. All right, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I think yeah. those types of things where everybody's happy doing it, I think it, the data can be really helpful. I think oftentimes when ketogenic diets aren't working and people are frustrated with them and they're not seeing the ketones at the levels consistently that they think they should be or that they thought they would be, that that additional data can be the thing that really gives them the information they need because everybody's going to be sensitive. You know, blood sugars are going to be sensitive to different foods. Your core foods that are going to affect blood sugar big time are going to all be the same, but um, I have seen, you know, people who, you know, grapes will shoot their blood sugar up and they just know that they can only have two or three grapes, you know. Um, but other, you know, another person can have 10 or 12 grapes and their blood sugar is just fine. And so um, I think there is a variability in what people tolerate. And especially when you look at foods that people like and foods that people eat frequently as you're trying to, to transition some of those, knowing the ones that are going, that are really affecting it. Or knowing even time of day or stress level that's affecting blood sugar oh, can be yeah. really helpful. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, a kid who comes home from a really hard day at school or um, is stressed about something or just, you know, got in an argument with a sibling or something like that, and you go check their blood sugar, it may not have been what they ate. It could have been that they were stressed, and that blood sugar is yeah. always going to go up with inflammation and stress. And so I think, there, I think that that would not be a bad idea at all. Um, I just think that it's got to fit into um, it's got to fit into how that kid's responding, um, and then parents have to actually do the work of understanding the diet and understanding the foods they're eating, and not just rely on the numbers. So, yeah. Yeah. if you just have all this data and you're just willy nilly throwing <laughs> foods at it and seeing what yeah. the blood sugar does, yeah, then yeah. you don't actually ever understand it. And um, and then you're just chained to that glucometer, and yep. so. But I think I think it's a fabulous idea, and I think that it could really work for a lot of families, and um, in especially in those initial stages when they're really trying to figure out how do we get to a stable place on the ketogenic diet. Because I know a lot of people who just spend you know six nine months a year trying to get things regulated, and that consistency of checking blood sugars post perennial, so after the meal. Um, can yep. really give you the data. You can see, okay, this is what that did. This is what that meal did. Um, yep. And not freaking out, like you said, when you get a recipe or get a meal that shot the blood sugar up, well, okay, we we may not try that again. We may try it again in a couple of weeks and see if it does the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just so variable. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, one other thing is that Audra and I, we every time Max uh, gets his finger poked we also poke ours and we yeah. check our blood sugar and so that's that's one thing that that's been kind of cool cool for us because it's like yeah we will we'll all respond to a meal slightly differently and you know right. and so some and it's just kind of interesting things, yeah <laughs> you know We've some sat things around will the Thanksgiving be table at our family and pass the glucometer around at times <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, I, I know Max is going to grow up, and his therapist is going to have so many issues to go through. You know? <laughs> <laughs> She'll be the therapist will be well entertained. I'm sure it'll be a, it'll yes. be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> oh well, Blakely, thank you so much. We had a couple more, but you know we're way over time, and we'll have more to talk about next time. Thank you so awesome. much. Um, and everyone, Blakely is about to have a beautiful baby in a couple days, so uh, everybody send uh, thoughts and prayers and good energy her way. And uh, we'll, I guess, the next time we talk with you, uh, you'll have a little baby in, in your arms. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Blakely. Happy holidays. Uh, all right, thanks. Bye. All right, bye.